Professor, are you ready to take questions or do yes. you want? Okay. Let's open the floor for questions on the unadulterated gold standard. Well, I've got one. There you go. I've got more than one, actually. About the yield curve, let's let's put that flip chart back. Your, yours is pretty nice too, really. Thank you. I think this is yours too, right? <coughs> um, I was just wondering if you knew, at the time that there were perpetual uh, bonds. What was the yield curve like? Was it more flat? No, this is the same. The flatness is a function of something else. I mean, uh, even if there are no perpetual bonds, that, as, that red asymptote is there. The interest rates are not going to get larger and larger. <clears throat> forever, they have an upper limit. So uh, the perpetuals don't change the picture. Now, when you ask what what makes it <coughs> steeper or flatter, the answer is uh, uh, the presence of uh, of. Uh, uh, borrowing short lending loan. The more borrowing short lending loan takes place, the flatter the curve is going to be. And, uh, and uh, ideally, there shouldn't be any. In which case, uh, you have uh, benchmark, which is the perpetual interest rate, and everything else is lower there than that, and then you have this increasing feature. Okay. Now, given that today sovereign countries only service the debt and never pay the principal back, yep. isn't that a little bit like a perpetual debt? Uh, in terms of its characteristic. Uh, that's, a, that's an extremely good point. And uh, I think I, uh, I completely agree with you. It's perpetual except in name, <laughs> you know? And it's, it's almost like borrowing short to lend long. The government has a long-term asset, a perpetual asset, but the borrowing has to keep being rolled over. Yeah. So it actually fits into the same problem. Yeah. Uh, at this point, deserves a lot more work and research than it's uh, going into to to work out the mathematics and the economics and all that to prove that actually we do have perpetuals and that's the government that and the government when perpetuals first came into fashion mm. that was optional the government had choice to borrow for 30 years or borrow perpetuals but now <laughs> it's all perpetual it's just covered up with this stupid idea that, okay, this is a 30-year, this is a 10-year. They're all perpetual. Uh, and, and very, you know, so in a way, the, uh, fooling people, it's not honest. It's not honest. But as soon as a, a government has to borrow the money to pay interest on its earlier borrowings, it's perpetual, though. I suggest one difference is in a real perpetual account, so there's no question of rolling it over. You never roll it over. You have no intention of rolling it over. So that doesn't come up as a problem. But if it's, if it's got a term, 
that is either repaid or rolled over, no question. So that puts you in a bit of a harder yeah. spot. You are right, and that's why I'm saying a lot more research has to go into it, because uh, <laughs> the government is no longer a free agent. It's just a, a victim of the circumstance. It's like a rudderless ship. I mean, uh, who can predict, uh, who can predict uh, what the, uh, at what rate can the gov U.S. government borrow Three years from now, nobody can predict it. Nobody can predict it. So that's the problem. It, it doesn't matter uh, if the, the rate of interest now for a perpetual bond is uh, that that's, was taken out a uh, hundred years ago at three percent. Um, if the rate of interest goes up to eight percent, then the capital value of that uh, of that perpetual bond will reduce to half or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, so you've got you've got the interest fixed, but the uh, the principal will adjust. So, so, so you can't fix principal and interest. One in, no. in the market, no. one will adjust, no. and the other one will stay fixed. That's that's absolutely correct. Do I get my bachelor's degree? <laughs> <laughs> Given he's absolutely correct, he wonders if he can get his bachelor's degree now. <laughs> Something in right. <laughs> <coughs> Professor, one more, uh, maybe not so much a question, but um, a fact that uh, and those who live in New Zealand uh, will no, no doubt confirm this, hopefully. Um, What's referred to there as inverted and abnormal has been more the normal uh, situation in New Zealand for well, as long as I've been here. Not so much at the moment or the last few years, but certainly in the 80s and 90s, we had a negative real, a negative. And inverted. Yeah, an inverted negative slope um, uh, yield curve for quite some considerable time. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, I couldn't understand why. And but well, it's it, a distortion. It's a distortion, but it lasted a long time here. That's what I'm, the point I want to make. If you want to make any comments on that, well, so uh, I'm not, not familiar with the can uh, last a long time. history of interest rates in New Zealand, but. It's clear that it wouldn't last only unless some interest group in the background, unknown to the rest of us, is doing something. And I, I can't even think of what it could be. Could be another country is manipulating New Zealand, or I don't know. Really, um, I don't know if this was relevant because. I was just starting, I was at university at that time, but um, New Zealand used to operate an MCI, so rather than the government setting an MCI, MCI I, don't even, it's, I don't even know, it's, it's an index, okay. and the, the Reserve Bank would say this is the level of the MCI, which was a, an index related to the currency and the interest rate. So rather than just focusing on an interest rate, they'd say, right, you know, the MCI level is, say, 100. And everyone would go boom and hit the currency. So the currency would drop out to drop the level to 100. Or so that 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 chase whatever the easiest one was. And I wonder whether that was a because um, I'm, I'm there was an arbitrage between New Zealand interest rates well, and, the, and, and well, the markets would just say, "Hey, it's easiest to hit the currency." What the what the what the Reserve Bank was trying to do was loosen monetary con conditions, especially after the Asian crisis. But all that happened was the currency went down, not the interest rate. So they didn't see the market interest rate. They didn't see this MCI level. And I'd have to look it up for what, what it meant, and the market would say. Let's just hit the currency. And I wonder if that kept the short end of the curve higher than it I don't 
What, what year were we talking about, did you? Um, well, I was coming out, so at the varsity, 90, I, my first year was 98. Pretty, pretty much the whole period from when I arrived yeah. in New Zealand in 86 to 98, or there about 99, as far yeah, as I'm yeah. concerned. Not all of it, cause, but a long, long portion of that period would have had a it, inverted it's, year. <coughs> it's a lot, of, I mean, I used to look at it. But it's just left my memory because of the little right. noise okay. around it. So. Really? Well, I suspect it's related to uh, international uh, forex. It's just like the carry trade, you know, the Japanese yen borrowing and U.S. lending and so on. So you, you, I don't think you can isolate the um, New Zealand dollar curve from the world situation. And if the New Zealand uh, dollar value is distorted, that would reflect in this or vice versa. That's just what, what you're saying is that the currency value has an impact on the yield curve. Sure. Do you agree yeah, well, with that? Yeah. Well, that's reasonable. But what if you get a situation as in New Zealand where we've got a relatively low GDP, 160 <coughs> billion, and yet the US NZ is the most, I think, highly traded currency in the world. It's obviously massive speculation. It bears no resemblance to the actual country. It's just a speculative play. And I think that surely that would distort all the theories or all the, um, the equations. The last, the last 10 years, the banks in New Zealand have been quarreling on, on the, basically on the overnight market or very short term market overseas and lending long. <laughs> so, so that's just the last 10 years. It's got really extreme. It's gotten worse in the last 10 years, but they were doing it 20 years ago as well. Okay. Yeah. It's crazy. Philip? Yeah. Um, <coughs> I don't know if it's relevant, but I uh, just want to understand a little bit on what the Federal Reserve announced uh, last month. Operation twist where they buy the <coughs> long bond from the market and sell the short bond by swapping and twisting the curve with the... Uh, don't know what's the purpose. I read a lot of comment, but whether it's on the U curve of the US bond, where they call it Operation Twist. Yes. Your question is, what was what was the purpose? Yeah, yeah. The purpose. Professor, do you want to answer? Or? Uh, no. no. Um, the, the purpose was to drop long rates, the long end, the, uh, the, the right-hand side of the yield curve, to drop those rates so that the slope went small, what, you know, Flatten. 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 Flatten, yes. So well, I mean, the rates were already zero here, right? So, <laughs> although they did discuss negative rates, <laughs> negative nominal rates, but they didn't go there. What Operation Twist was to bring this rate down without adding money supply, without doing QE by, you know, buying this and selling that. And it had an impact, but only for a short while. Um, but remember, I think I said that on Monday, in my opinion, that's the whole game now, is to keep that low, what, by whatever means. I think, I think part of it was during QE2, the world was quite surprised that although there was all this bond buying, the rate of interest on the long end of the curve was going up. And what I think was going on was the banks were borrowing short to lend long. <laughs> they were they were um, selling. Well, no, they were uh, yeah they were selling bills to buy bonds. And now the Fed came in and allowed them to unwind that trade at a big profit. That's what I think was really the actual. I could be wrong on that, but that's my supposition. The banks took these huge positions where they're short this, long this, and now the Fed says we'll buy this and <laughs> could well be buy this and sell this. Given that the Recapitalizing the bank is so important. That's one way of achieving a lot. It's perverse. Remember what this curve represents: a risk scenario, the, the oops factor. The longer Murphy's law has to kick in, the worse it gets. I think money is very scared of what's going to happen further down the road, and it's it's concentrating on the low end. And the Fed says, okay, because if the Fed did not intervene, this curve would get even steeper. You see what I'm saying? The normal curve would be nor abnormal in the other direction. The long yield going even higher and higher, i.e. runaway interest rates. 
And that's what they're trying to preempt. And there's lots of short-term money there because people are, what do we do with our money? Well, we put it into uh, T-bills 30 or 60 or 90 days and we save our money. But they don't want to put their money into 10, 30 years. So it's, it's trying to resist that not, and perhaps bring it lower as well. Uh, just to follow up, I thought it was part of the reason was China was uh, converting all the long bond to a shorter dated bond at time. China with two trillion, three trillion of the bond, and they announced that and they were swapping it to a shorter date, two years, six years bond. Um, and I look at PIMCO, they were saying they don't hold any long dated bond, only two years, they consider cash or something. And that fact, in response to that, they, they do that. Because otherwise, the long data bond that you will go up. Could well be another other reason. Uh, the, the one thing is certain, it's very damaging to oh. the country. So it upsets all kinds of investment horizons. There's no free market. No, no. <laughs> and somebody is making big money behind the scenes. During, um, you said during the 90s. Oh, just wait for your question. I think we need a, a reach for it. Conditions index, which would move them sort of together, but interest rates would stabilise and then the uh, currency would drop. Sorry, that's all I wanted to Thanks. Thank you. Was capital flowing out of the country during the uh, New Zealand? Did it make, make yeah, it? yeah, the currency was getting smacked around. Yeah. Okay. So, wouldn't that be uh, the effect of the borrowing shop to land on because they're trying to liquidate the shop that was which dries up interest rate. But long term, it's harder to put it. Well, just as a corollary to that, I think uh, New Zealand dollar dropped down to about 39.75. I think on that day, the Bank of New Zealand borrowed $250 million US dollars for the housing market. So they packed the bottom of the, of the market. And I think they paid it back uh, several years later when the dollar was up around the 75, 80 mark. Did very nicely out of it. <laughs> so did the government actually because they gave them a huge tax bill. Are there any other questions? Ben. Uh, professor, you said the problem, something like the problem of illicit interest arbitrage is not very well understood by mainstream Austrian economists. Could you get a little bit more into what they are missing? Uh, good question. Uh, what they are missing? I think they are defending the Austrian cycle theory, business cycle theory, rear guard action. But I, 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 I mean, there are good points in that theory, but as a whole, it's not a finished. Thing. It, uh, you just have to keep working on it. But they don't, won't admit it. They said, no, no, it's in the Bible. <laughs> well, let me just add one thing to that. I've been written several papers that I published and got into arguments with Nish and other people very publicly, and an acting man and a couple of other people. Um, they're condemning all fractional reserve banking. So it's kind of, it's almost a heresy to them to say this particular flavor of fractional reserve, is, or fractional reserve banking is bad, because then by implication that would mean there's another kind of fractional reserve banking that isn't bad. Mm. And they can't admit that. Their dogma says all fractional reserve banking yeah. is, is bad, all lending is usury. And so they're just, no, 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 we don't make any distinction. It's fractional reserve with bad period, bad full period. stop. There's, there's nothing else to say. That is yeah. a complete theory. And that's it. I'm very grateful to you, Keith, because this is something I'm 
so glad to have an opportunity to say about. Because when you say unadulterated gold standard, I am not dismissing fractional reserve banking lock, stock, and barrel. Some, as you say, are bad, but some are not just not bad, but normal. Because what we have today is not even a remote image of what commercial banking should be. Commercial banks came about over hundreds of years of evolution as banks which finance trade, consumer goods moving from the producer to the consumer. And there was a very restricted list of assets which a commercial bank could have. And certainly mortgages were not among them. Government bonds and notes were not among them. And a whole lot of, uh, the very few assets were eligible for a commercial bank to have. And uh, other than gold, it was real bills. And real bills had to be defined very carefully. For example, the one thing I pointed out during my presentation that it's not enough to have some goods which ultimately will be consumed. This good has to move and move at a certain speed to the consumer. If it falls below that speed, which happens also for natural reasons, then that particular good falls out of what I call the social circulating capital. That's the mass of good which will be consumed within 91 days. And uh, <coughs> there must be consumer goods in a number of other conditions. And this mass of goods, what I call social circulating capital, could expand, could shrink, the constituent parts could change, and that's clear because uh, we have the seasons of the year and the seasonal merchandise um, changes with the seasons of the year. You could think of clothing and so on. Food also changes with the season. So uh, this is the nature given situation. And therefore, um, commerce has to reflect that. And um, uh, <coughs> what makes real bills very special is that they are the next best thing to gold itself. Because they mature into gold in 90 days or less. That's very important. All the other promises, bonds, notes, this, that, futures, are not, not, don't come near to the liquidity what a real bill represents. So, uh, a bank which carries, say, 40% of its assets in the form of gold and 60% in real bills representing merchandise which moves sufficiently fast to the ultimate consumer. This is not fractional reserve, that's full 100% reserve. Because the the, the clearing segment of the assets is, is the bills. And just, you have to think of it. If you, uh, if 91 days, that's about uh, you know, that's exactly a quarter of a year. 
So uh, the, um, the merchandise is maturing and ultimately the goods are sold. And this is full, full reserve. It's a misnomer to call such a bank a fractional reserve bank. And uh, they are these uh, critiques are barking uh, up on the wrong tree. They should criticize the composition of assets of the banks. But uh, the, the fact that uh, real bills are extremely marketable it's much easier to liquidate a portfolio of real bills than if you're loaded with mortgages. And even admitting that those are all, all very high quality mortgages. Because uh, you are sinking your investment funds into brick and mortar. And they don't fly. But by contrast, uh, food flies, bread flies, and then various clothes, shoes fly, because people do wear out shoes and then they have to renew them, have to buy. New. So the marketability of these goods is uh, very high and therefore, and consumers do need them and therefore they will be willing to pay the gold coin to get them if the government puts the gold coins available to them. So uh, I think this is a very, very important point that uh, the uh, so-called fractional reserve banking cannot be just applied like a blanket refusal that we don't consider them. Oh, and, and what's the proof? Because you could ask, well, uh, these are just words, but give us some convincing argument. Because real bills, I think I have used that uh, simile before, the real bills can fly on their own wings and under their own steam. But mortgages cannot. Government bonds cannot, but if you look at the spread in the government bond market, you will see that it's uh, not easy to liquidate. Uh, even in the normal circumstances when government bonds are not so super abundant as they are today, if the government bonds are in bank portfolios, over and above the capital ratios. I mean, we admit that the banks are allowed to carry their capital in a wider range of assets, including government bonds or perpetuals or what have you. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But when they start putting more and more assets uh, or more and more government bonds into this, that's going to freeze up. The co and because what could happen is that all the banks simultaneously run short of money or gold, and then they try to liquidate their assets, government bonds, and that could just destroy the bond market. It could. The spreads will be so wide that the, these bonds are practically unsaleable because the banks cannot afford to take such big losses. By then, my critiques, I suppose there are critiques <coughs> present in this room, would say, hey, the same applies to the bills. If there is a demand for gold, <coughs> high demand for gold, then the commercial banks will be put on, uh, <coughs> under pressure. They will have to liquidate <coughs> bills. They will have to sell bills, get the gold to satisfy their depositors who <coughs> scramble for gold coins. 
which is true, but uh, what it leaves uh, out of consideration is the fact that when you look at the banking system as a whole, there is satisfactory demand for bills, real bills. Why? Because the real bills are the best earning assets of the commercial bank, which need earning assets. They have to have the income which they generate from the discount. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, and it's an asset in the sense that <coughs> it has so short maturity. And it matures, the bank can pay them in gold coins. So I would characterize the demand for real bills as practically infinite <coughs> because the ba banking system as a whole, and I'm talking about the ideal situation, there's no <coughs> borrowing short, lending long, and illicit interest appetite. <coughs> the banks scramble for real bills. They want to put them in their portfolio. They want to expel gold, some. Now, they can be different countries, far, halfway around the world. <coughs> but that's no problem. As there is a, a, a very high demand for gold coins in, uh, say, Australia, there could be, uh, the gold doesn't disappear, it uh, is seeking outlets, and uh, it will show up elsewhere in, uh, say, Europe or America or South America, and then they will, uh, 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 the banks will want more bills. So, you have to look at the bill market as a worldwide market. And the demand for real bills is, is present. Now, I'm not talking about extreme cases like a war breaks out, a nuclear attack, a phone cut, you know, or some such things. But in the normal course of business, there will be always <coughs> demand for real bills because I repeat, real bills are the next best thing to gold. They mature into gold within 90 days or less. This is, uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know how convincing it is, but uh, in a sh short discussion, that's the best I can do. Yes, uh, Professor, the other side, the supply side, of bills is constrained because there's only so much spending and there's only so much physical capacity oh, that's right. in the industry to, to bring more real bills. You can eat only so much. That's right. And if the demand is there and the <coughs> supply is never fulfilled, that's kind of like gold. The demand for gold is there, but you've got to dig it out of the ground. Yeah. So it's a real bill and real money. Real bill is the red. If a country is losing gold, <coughs> the gold exporters don't go to the gold mines to get their gold, they go to the bill market. <coughs> and that's how they get the gold, and vice versa. If a country is invaded by gold, more gold than it wants, anyhow, what happens is the gold goes to the bill market. And then uh, it pushes down the discount rate. So this is a kind of shock absorber. Uh, you, you cannot have too much gold for the simple reason that if the country has too much gold that shows up in the bill market and there's a cushion there, the, the, the discount rate. Now the, inter the rate of interest, and Mises is right about that, um, <coughs> cannot go to zero. But the discount rate can. And what, if you want to imagine what kind of world it is where the discount rate is zero, you just have to imagine a city where the sidewalks have been converted into open-air markets. 
uh, you know, uh, uh, in uh, some European countries with the religious calendar, there are always open-air markets if uh, uh, a parish uh, has a patron saint who is St. Catherine, then on St. Catherine's Day there's an open-air market where all these uh, uh, vendors who always move with the markets, okay, they go there and set up their tents and offer these merchandise. Now, if the this country goes to zero in one country, then the whole country will become such an open air market. Why? Because in order to have a tent, you require practically zero capital. Because the you, your supplier will be happy to take your bill. You sign the bill and so on, and you will be able to pay. You don't need 90 days to pay. You pay at the end of the fair, and uh, everybody is happy. And, and therefore, zero this country it is not uncommon, and we know how to live uh, with it. It's, this is no problem. So I, I think you have to take all these into consideration. In the 1920s something in the United States, before 1930, there were a lot of gold flowing from Europe to America. America was exporting goods to what in Europe. And uh, it, it happened also that because there are a lot of gold going to America, and the real view, the rate discount rate would drop to very low. And then, what was it like that? No, it was in the Oh, no real I just said there were no real bills in the 1930s. Real bills were, were ended at World War One. Uh, no international real bills. So, um, because I read uh, from this guy, he was saying that uh, not real bill, but the goal was going to U.S. and uh, a lot of gold and. Uh, the Federal Reserve were keeping the gold in the boat, locking it up, and in a way to keep US dollar exchange rate low. I don't know why I say that. I didn't, didn't quite understand. Just like what China is doing in a different way, keeping the yuan, the RMB, exchange rate low against US dollar, just to help the exporter. So that's why I want to understand the mechanism. Of well, all I can say is you <coughs> should hang out in stuff, in real goods, and it's funded or financed by the real bills flowing in the opposite direction. Now, if you don't have real bills, then you have to start transferring gold or some other means of payment. And if you have paper dollars, which are not real value, then you can just pile up to the ceiling. This so, up, you know, but this can happen. you comment on that? Uh, uh, because I didn't quite understand, that's why I asked. The gold were flowing to the U.S. in the 1920s because of all the trade. And um, the Federal Reserve, were, in a way, was uh, sterilizing the gold by locking it up and to keep the U.S. dollar competitive in terms of that. So that, what was it? The well, price? I think that they were, not, they were not sterilizing gold. They were issuing banknotes in the 1920s or credit, excess credit. So they would keep the uh, dollar low. They, they, um, the and, uh, perhaps. That was, I don't know what the reason was. In the 20s. 20s. What is it the because the US and 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 US US so was doing that just you like what I know. The 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 America. And so another you reason out, is if has to step into you devalue and your currency, your yes, yes. Or, or your currency was safer oh, than if you devalued your currency and here. It started to flow Recent devaluation suggested that for the time being it's a safe currency. And they would not do that because they knew the gold was going to flow. But once the gold goes to the bond, it's going to happen. So there was no real view in the... Rudy? Rudy, yeah. 
Um, your point, Philip, is um, that you would like to understand that you, when, when why... In 20, uh, the gold was flowing from Europe to... Uh, the gold was flowing from Europe to the U.S. in the 30s. And somebody made a comment, uh, I think it was Mike Melanie or something, that the, the gold he was, he was making a comment that the Federal Reserve purposely, intentionally sterilized the gold by locking it up. Right. And well, to keeping the U.S. Uh, exchange rate with the other exchange rate, I mean the other currency low, so that the exporter can be competitive, keep on exporting. Like, just like what China is doing un without gold, just uh, keeping the learning fee. When China receives US dollar, they sterilize it by buying US bond and keeping the learning fee or yuan low, so that the exporter can be competitive exporting the goods. That was the last 10, 20 years. So, so is that a comment, or are you asking, is it the same thing? Was it the case of U.S. in the 1920s? Was that the intention of uh, well, ster sterilizing the gold? I don't quite understand sterilizing the gold. I just want to... Professor? Um, <coughs> the only thing I disagree with, really, is the, what was the cause for the gold <coughs> flow to the United States. I think... Uh, Trade was in shambles, world trade. So very little America could export because they retired. America had these uh, smooth uh, the laws which uh, put a very smooth high Holly. tariff. Hmm? Smooth Holly? Smooth Holly laws. Oh. And uh, Europe retaliated, so world trade was in shambles, um, very little. But, uh, but that, that was at the end of the 1920s, wasn't it? Yeah, exactly. yeah but uh, <laughs> as they went into the depression, it got more and more pronounced. Yeah, right. But, uh, but I, I give you the real reason. Uh, you see, the, the writing was on the wall that Europe is going to have World War II. So a lot of Europeans move their gold from Europe to the United States. You might say, well, the dollar was just devalued in 1933 and even confiscated, so uh, how come that the people moved their gold? Well, this, this is the interesting uh, point that if you devalued yesterday, <coughs> your currency was co considered uh, more highly than if you had devalued a year ago because a recently devalued currency was Perverse. relatively safer for the hot money than a currency which was devalued years ago so it was ripe again for another devaluation there. And, and uh, the, uh, the foreigners were much more confident that their property rights will not be violated like America no problem violating the property rights of every citizen by confiscating gold. The foreigners were more confident that because they were given the extra protection from their own central banks. So, but I don't know, but that's the way I see it. Well, it's 12.30. So, thank you once again, Professor, for an interesting lecture. Thank and uh, we'll really reconvene at 2. Please join me in thanking you. And we are looking forward to your...